Hi, my name is Esper Calas. I'm ID uh, specialist and I'm full professor of medicine at the Department of Infectious and Parasitic Diseases at the University of Sao Paulo. So my task today is to talk about yellow fever, the epidemiological situation in Brazil, and uh, present some work we've done in uh, evaluating predictors of mortality. And I'm gonna wrap up bringing some ideas with you guys on how we can treat this disease and some work we're doing at our site. So everybody knows that uh, uh, yellow fever is a very deadly disease and it's caused by a virus called a yellow fever virus in the genus of flavivirus and family of flaviviridae. This is a type four Baltimore um, RNA uh, single-stranded uh, virus and has this, uh, this schema on your right-hand side. Um, we know that this virus has been spreading through Brazil for quite some time. And in fact, we see that uh, since 2013 and 14, uh, cases were pretty mild in an entire country. And you see in the shaded areas where uh, we have uh, used to have more concern about yellow fever, sylvatic transmission and episodic transmission. Uh, where it was mandatory in Brazil, the coverage of vaccines. Now, since 2014 and 15, we start seeing a, 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 a slowly resurgence of cases that came from north and came all the way down, traveling to Midwest Brazil, you can see here, and then uh, spreading bigger numbers in 16, 17, when we had a, an outbreak in the state of Minas Gerais, Southeast Brazil. And finally, uh, the outbreak, in, a big outbreak in the metropolitan area of Sao Paulo to, to 2017 and 18, that still caused some cases um, as late as 2019. I'll talk a little bit more about that. All this data is presented uh, by the Minister of Health and the latest update they have, unfortunately, it was only in 2019. And this is the, the 2019 um, uh, summary of cases reported in the country. I'm assuming that because of 2020 uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, have um, they had a hard time to wrap up 2020 cases available to us up until today. But until uh, 2019, um, the number of cases reported uh, by um, uh, the the uh, mid of the year, and just bear with me for a second. Usually, the cases of um, yellow fever occur usually in our summer, um, and uh, it's expected to happen the first half of the year. Uh, and what we saw here, there was 82 cases in 2019, mostly concentrated in southeast and south of the country, as you see in these. Um, uh, red dots here, which are human cases, and in, in non-human primates in the green dots. So you see that the virus that came from north of Brazil in 2013-14 spread downwards, uh, south, southbound, came to the, the Midwest, and then came down here to um, to to um, to the south. This year, we we heard some reports of few cases occurring in the, the deepest uh, south country in Brazil, Rio Grande do Sul, and but these are just case reports. We don't have further information. But now, what we see is this trend: the virus coming downwards uh, towards the south. Now, um, this also um, can overlap, and we can we should make this this, this, this uh, discussion on vaccine coverage. As you know, we have a very effective vaccine against yellow fever. It's a live attenuated strain. Here in Brazil, we use the 17DD strain. This vaccine uh, is produced uh, by Biomanguinhos in Rio de Janeiro, where uh, you find the biggest producing uh, yellow fever vaccine plant in the world. Um, and there are about six others spread throughout the, the world. Now, you see that the coverage in Brazil was restricted mostly to the Amazon basin in some parts of the Midwest mostly. But then with, um, and here in Africa, you see that the very lower coverage because 
uh, because of probably local infrastructure, the, the number of countries that provided uh, coverage was um, sort of limited, uh, probably based on the availability of these vaccines. This remained pretty much unchanged until uh, uh, the 80s. And you can see there is a de uh, diminished area of, uh, of uh, diminished coverage in Africa as well, especially in the West. And uh, this continues to drop in the 90s and 2000s. And this is because uh, the awareness of yellow fever have also diminished because very few cases have been reported. But then um, it was in, in the, the, the late 90s and early 2000s that we saw some cases popping up in the state of Sao Paulo, which uh, raised concern and eyebrows whether we should expand vaccination. So the country started an effort to vaccinate um, other areas, basically covering the entire nation with vaccine availability, but was not a, um, a, a, a very strong campaign to vaccinate in southeast and the south of the country in the coast area. Now, in parallel, what you can see is the coverage in African countries have diminished over the years, which created the, 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 the best uh, environment for the virus to start spreading again. And again, uh, what we saw was in 2010, uh, there was a, a, an effort to increase coverage that uh, increased to other countries in South America due to reporting of cases. And um, that I reported, uh, that I, I mentioned in my early slides. And it was in 2016 when the, 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 the outbreak in Minas Gerais occurred, there was a major effort to vaccinate. Uh, the same thing happened in Africa, efforts to vaccinate more regions due to the spread of cases of transmission, especially in Gola and Congo, where they had a major outbreak in 2016, sort of mirroring what happened in, in, in Brazil at the same time in Minas Gerais State. Now, this is the Minas Gerais State, so the 16-17 outbreak. Lots of cases occurring mostly in the state of Minas Gerais and on the border with uh, Espirito Santo state. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of cases, pretty dramatic spread of the virus. And why this happened? Because the vaccine coverage has dropped in most cities down to less than uh, 40%. So that created the necessary scenario to uh, virus transmission. All right. So, um, the virus was 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 moving downwards, uh, and uh, the the the, uh, the surveillance of uh, episodic transmission by the state of São Paulo predicted that the virus could come close to the city of São Paulo by uh, the end of 2017. So they start a lot of efforts in trying to to create um, uh, ring vaccination campaigns to uh, avoid the virus to enter in, the, in the, 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 the metropolitan region of Sao Paulo, 20 million people, a lot of people then that are, uh, most of these people are not vaccinated. And what happened was exactly what they predicted. They, they used um, uh, the, the macaque movement corridors in the, in the wild areas of the state to bring the virus downwards and came close to Sao Paulo metropolitan area and what happened was, despite the vaccination efforts, lots of cases. So we had about 537 cases in this season, and, and it was it was a nightmare because we had about 37% mortality amongst those individuals due to the severity of the disease. And the severity of the disease is reflected by the signs and symptoms. We all know it's uh, that despite most infections are asymptomatic, the incubation period of five, the three to six days, on average about five days, um, uh, is associated with pronounced viremia. I mean, the amount of virus you'll see in a later slide is pretty uh, uh, dramatic that we'll be seeing these individuals, pretty remarkable. And most of the, the, the signs and symptoms are chills, fever, headache, back pain. This is something that call a lot of the attention to yellow fever when you see somebody coming with a acute febrile illness that has a, a pronounced back pain, myalgias, nausea, and vomiting. And there is this, this traditional uh, faget sign uh, described by uh, this French physician working in Louisiana in the 19th century 
uh, where you see uh, a high fever with, with a low heart rate. Um, it's, uh, it's also um, uh, very suggestive, although not exclusive to yellow fever. So the severe forms, unfortunately, can evolve to bleeding disorders, uh, liver failure, and multi-organ failure that can lead to the death of the patients. Uh, the lab laboratory findings are usually leukopenia, as the other um, uh, flavivirus do, clotting disorders in a severe hepatitis characterized by the aspartate transaminase with a higher uh, um, uh, uh, levels than uh, um, uh, the um, uh, in 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 the in the blood workup, uh, also um, which is a reflection of the hepatocyte apoptosis. We also see liver failure in later stage in encephalopathy, and this disease can peak uh, in the end of the first and beginning of the second week after onset of symptoms. Um, and for those who recover, we see jaundice and uh, and sometimes in this acute phase also we found we find nephrotic syndrome. Now, um, the phase of increased severity of the disease um, um, leads to about 40% of death in hospitalized patients that uh, it's sometimes despite the level of support these patients receive. They need intensive support and uh, we need to keep an eye on secondary infections in which recover with time. And the amazing thing about yellow fever is despite the massive damage to the liver uh, cells and liver function, those who recover completely recover their living function. It's amazing. The probably uh, cause of this is because the virus induces apoptosis of uh, hepatocytes that can uh, uh, be re uh, repopulate the liver uh, architecture and then resume uh, liver function if uh, the acute phase is, uh, it has, is overcome by the patient. Now, the immunity is long lasting after infection. Uh, those individuals uh, do not require vaccination thereafter because the insult of the antigen is enough to create a very strong and, and, and lifelong um, uh, immune response. Well, during the uh, first semester of 2018 outbreak, we put together an effort of several um, uh, of our team um, to trying to uh, characterize suspected yellow fever cases in two main uh, referral hospitals in the city of Sao Paulo. Here is uh, uh, Hospital das Clinicas in Emilio Ribas, who received most of the cases. And we enrolled into our cohort, uh, confirmed the yellow fever diagnosis with qualitative and quantitative PCR, uh, qualitative, uh, um, qualitative and, and quantitative uh, PCR, um, for those who uh, unfortunately died, uh, we were able to assess in most of them autopsy specimens uh, to confirm the diagnosis, created the sample repository and followed these individuals over time. Uh, so we include 76 confirmed cases, uh, 51 at the uh, Hospital des Clinicas, 25 at the Emilio Ribas Institute, and 74 of those were confirmed by yellow fever RNA detection and two by autopsy, and 35.5% uh, died of the disease in par with what we've been seeing in the state reports. So the first thing that we were able to confirm is we had this outbreak caused by one strain, and this variant is from the South African type one and the subtype E. So you see the all the, 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 the first uh, samples we sequenced and were confirmed with the further samples clustered into this, uh, this group. And um, that um, was also the same strain that's been uh, identified in different places by different groups in Brazil, um, either in Rio de Janeiro or in, 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 uh, in other areas of the country. Now, this uh, also confirmed that this, this, what we had was basically an, an, an epidemic amongst non-human primates coming from the north to the south and spilled over to human populations where the number of people uh, who were um, um, susceptible to the disease were infected and developed uh, yellow fever. 
Now, amongst these 76 patients, here are the clinical characteristics. So we see that most of them had um, um, uh, the days of, of after onset of symptoms was on average six. Uh, the 42% had comorbidities, 91% presented with fever, uh, 63 headaches, and uh, myalgias were were uh, present 74. So it's uh, pre basically the the uh, the clinical presentation of those individuals. Now, when we compare the clinical presentation com uh, from sur uh, between survivors and deceased patients, we saw that only two variables was associated in an univariate analysis with poor outcome. The first was age, um, higher age in those who died. In, 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 in males, although this uh, barely reached significance, is in reflection by the fact that most people who acquired the disease were male. So, um, and when we did the multivariate analysis, this variable uh, dropped, so it's not associated with severity. Now, the laboratory findings, then, then we start seeing some things, a uh, few things very interesting. The first was uh, a pretty um, higher number of uh, neutrophils amongst those who passed away. So you see the very uh, significant value. So these individuals, although the value of, uh, the, the number of neutro circulating neutrophils was normal within the re expected range, was significantly higher than the, the neutropenia that's described for the disease. So what is that? So we're going to go over this issue in more detail later. So you see the aspartate aminotransferase was pretty high in those who, who died. Same for the alanine aminotransferase in reflection to the, the, the extensive uh, liver damage that these people uh, develop. They had an enlarged INR, uh, which is a, a clotting disorder, uh, which uh, also helps classifying this disease into the hemorrhagic um, fever uh, diseases. And uh, elevated bilirubins. And finally, creatinine was also pretty higher in those who, who died. Now, and here is the first time a group have uh, described that, uh, has described that a higher virus load in fact, it's about 1.3 log higher in those who, who died in comparison to those who survived. Now, uh, I'll show you the, the Kepler-Meyer curve. So you see that uh, higher age above 50, 45. And here, all the breakpoints were the, the medium value uh, for the, these next uh, set of, uh, of, of graphs. So you see higher age had a, a survival curve that's... Uh, 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 that's worse than, than lower age. Here's the neutrophil counts, pretty good split. And the, 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 the cutoff was here, 4,000 uh, neutrophils per millimeter uh, cubic uh, of blood. And also AST, higher than 3,500, pretty worst um, outcome for those individuals. And IN, INR, uh, also pretty very strong split between the two groups. And finally, indirect bilirubins, uh, also pretty higher in those who died. In here, I'm showing just uh, uh, selected variables because many of them were codependent, such as AST and ALT. They pretty much same went to the same uh, same direction. Here's the creatinine. You see that uh, above 2.4, it's pretty um, uh, a groom outcome for these individuals. So. Uh, and finally, the virus load. So you see uh, here is 5.1 log as the breaking point, the median breaking point. Uh, those with higher virus load had uh, worse outcome. Now, we ran a multivariate Cox proportional regression model to see what are of these, uh, all the, these variables were um, independent predictors of mortality. And here, what we can tell is age stand uh, as, as independent, uh, higher neutrophils, uh, higher creat, uh, uh, in, in, I'm sorry, uh, higher uh, AST, and finally higher, higher virus load. So you can see that uh, indirect bilirubin and creatinine probably was a reflection of severe disease instead, uh, just uh, a predictor for mortality. So it's more of a late stage uh, consequence of this disease. Now, uh, 
Uh, with that, we, we were able to create event associated algorithms uh, and just look at the bear with me for a moment. So uh, for those coming into our award um, with yellow fever conferred by PCR, if the neutrophils were below uh, 4,000 4, cells, then, uh, and the virus load was lower than 5.1 5 5 .1 logs, so the mortality was 11%, okay? Now, let's go the other direction. Neutrophils above 4,000, yellow fever virus load above 5.1 logs, mortality was 100%. So with this kind of algorithm, algorithms, we're able to create decision-making trees that will help uh, defining who are the patients more prone to um, de develop uh, the severe form of the disease and unfortunately uh, die of the disease. But also we can um, select those that are uh, in more need for intensive care uh, treatment. Now, as a, as a summary, the independent predicts of death in these individuals are uh, senescence uh, due to the higher age, probably uh, reflecting a, dis, a, a, a building uh, dysfunctional immune system that helps with, uh, happens with, with, with the years passing by. The second thing was were neutrophils, and we're not sure what was the cause for this um, association. We suspect could be just a reflection of inflammation, but also could be also a result of bacterial translocation or cytokine storm happening in these individuals. So we have one, one uh, research project going on that are, we're wrapping up to trying to understand what are the big mechanisms behind the increased neutrophils in association with uh, poor prognosis. Uh, the third one was uh, uh, an elevated AST level, and probably this is a proxy for the liver damage caused by direct cyto cytopathic um, cytopathic effect of the virus. And finally, uh, the virus load, which, all, which is also pretty um, intuitive to think about because it's uh, a pathogen-driven injury uh, due, uh, in leading to this cyt cytopathic uh, effect. Now, what can we do with these individuals? A few slides to talk about this. The first is uh, we don't have a specific treatment available. So there are some some drugs being evaluated in mostly in vitro and, and animal models. So we need to wait until more data. So I'll present a few things about sofosbuvir, galidazivir, and monoclonal antibodies in the next few slides. So the first is, do, uh, uh, there was an effort by our department led by uh, Professor Levin, uh, who is uh, working on a clinical trial to evaluate uh, sofosbuvir as a treatment option. There is data presented by different groups showing that uh, sofosbuvir can, can, can uh, modulate virus replication in vitro and animal models. So it's an open label clinical trial with 90 subjects. Um, we enrolled uh, during the, the outbreak 62 and the DSMB has requested this study to keep on going. Now it's on pause because no further cases have been detected in our region. So um, um, this study is still waiting to, to, to uh, wrap up with uh, more individuals if yellow fever uh, cases come to our uh, site. Now we are evaluating a drug called galidazivir, which is a um, uh, RPRT um, RNA uh, nucleoside polymerase in inhibitor. Um, and uh, that was developed for Marburg virus uh, before, and in vitro activity has shown clinical, uh, if, uh, has have shown in vitro effect against um, yellow fever virus and confirmed by um, animal models in hamsters. And finally, uh, there was a, a phase one study showing that IM is pretty safe and well tolerated. Uh, so um, we decided to go ahead with this program in collaboration with uh, BioCris, the developer of this drug. So here is the, 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 the hamster model showing that galidazivir is pretty well, um, uh, pretty good in, in preventing um, uh, death of, of um, uh, in fe uh, um, yellow fever challenged hamsters, uh, as you can see here. So with that, uh, we created this, this, this phase that there is, uh, um, uh, there are three protocols, uh, two protocols. This one is to evaluate a phase one 
<clears throat> those escalation that has has finished uh, it's pretty well tolerated we're now uh waiting cases to enroll into a dose escalation of uh, galidesivir in uh in in yellow fever patients so um, um this is on hold waiting to see if we see cases in our region and from phase one dose escalation we're gonna uh, select one specific dose to move to phase 1b where we're gonna enroll 30 individuals in a randomization of two to one galidivazivir versus placebo to see if we can treat the, the acute phase disease. And finally, I'll keep, uh, I'll drop a word on monoclonal antibodies because this is another approach that <clears throat> has made <clears throat> last year to the New England Journal of Medicine, a group developed a monoclonal antibody that can neutralize 17D in vitro. And uh, what they've shown is um, they have a dose-dependent effect against um, uh, um, the virus in vitro, and uh, they were able to demonstrate that in animal models, um, um, they were able to uh, to prevent uh, um, uh, the viremia in these animals, and uh, in then they they ran ahead and did a, a clinical trial. So, what was the clinical trial? The challenge was. Uh, to use uh, the 17D as a, as a challenge, the vaccine virus as a challenge. So you can see here that those treated with the monoclonal antibody did not have any detectable viremia compared to those individuals who had, in most of them, uh, virus uh, detecting their blood. Now, um, when they looked at the seroconversion, that was the interesting part. Those individuals who were treated with the monoclonal, uh, were infected with the, the vaccine strain, uh, they, they seroconverted. But now when they looked into, and that's neutralizing antibodies, when they looked those treated with the monoclonal antibody, just one mild detection of neutralization, but uh, 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 by and large, those individuals did not develop uh, seroconversion, meaning that the use of this monoclonal antibody was able to um, induce a sterilizing immunity uh, not allowing the virus uh, antigen to be seen by their immune system, which is pretty good. So uh, this is, although the criticism for this, 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 this work, they never used a challenge in vitro uh, with uh, wild uh, yellow fever virus, which is, can behave differently uh, compared to 17D. In conclusion, so we know that um, uh, episodic spreading of the virus have been happening in Brazil in the past years, coming north through south and in locations where there were susceptible uh, popu human population in the surrounding regions of this uh, episodic transmission that we detected few uh, outbreaks in Minas Gerais mostly um, in 2016, and then in the state of Sao Paulo in 2017 and 18, and now early 2019 in the state of Sao Paulo and the state of Paraná uh, down in the south region of Brazil. 2020 seems to have reached all the way down to Rio Grande do Sul, although in lower numbers. This, this is a very severe disease. It's, it's a real life-threatening disease. So, I, I mean, um, we need to have strategies in place to prevent transmission. Because if you move back in history, uh, yellow fever was, was in, the, in, the, in, 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 in romances, in history books, in everywhere, and even played a huge role in the World War I and World War II conflicts because um, um, uh, strategies to control virus dissemination uh, was key uh, for troops uh, to advance in, especially in, in equatorial uh, and sub-equatorial areas in the world. Um, and the other thing is, uh, uh, just go back to the Panama Canal story. It's an amazing story uh, because control of yellow fever and malaria were key to, um, to um, um, uh, allow uh, the Americans to build the canal, uh, which um, the French did not accomplish due to these two diseases uh, a few years earlier. Um, now, in, in our cohort, the third point is uh, we did uh, uh, a study, a prospective cohort 
uh, to identify predictors of death. We were able to identify those four, uh, and that's been able to uh, um, construct other hypotheses over the disease pathogenesis and perhaps create better strategies to treat these people. Uh, uh, there's, there's no available treatment uh, that's specific to control virus replication. Several options are on board, and, and these novel therapeutic approaches are warranted because um, uh, more outbreaks are expected to happen. And if they occur in, 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 in larger numbers, we need to deploy ways to control this virus transmission um, and uh, prevent uh, uh, those to acquire using vaccines, but also treat those individuals. So we need um, better strategies to, to treat this deadly disease. With that, I will conclude my, my presentation. Um, and thanks uh, to the group uh, working in this cohort. I'd like to start by um, Ho Ye Li, who is uh, our uh, intensive care physician, who were able to, who um, uh, sought for all these uh, uh, care for all these individuals, cared for all these individuals in our hospital. Um, um, we also had uh, special thanks to Vivian, who did uh, most of the analysis of our manuscript, Alice, who did um, help writing the manuscript, the entire group who followed those individuals, they were able to um, collect samples and uh, analyze those results, and those clinicians who uh, were aside, be uh, bedside to collect all the clinical information uh, and, and also providing assist those individuals. We would like to, I would like to thank the Instituto de Medicina Tropical at the University of Sao Paulo, especially José Levy, who did the PCR for those individuals, standardized and did all of them in the virus loads. Natalia, who did um, uh, help in this effort. Esther Sabino and Ingra, who did the sequencing of these viruses in, uh, in, our, in our study. And fine, they also have more, more publications on that regard as well. And also the colleagues from the Emilio Ribas Institute, who collected samples from and, and clinical data from the, the, the patients admitted to that hospital, and in 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 later uh, but not la uh, last but not le uh, le um, 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 so Ray Taylor from BioCrist, um, uh, who um, helped put in, putting together the yellow fever uh, galidesvir treatment uh, program, um, in. Uh, um, I, uh, uh, I can provide for those who are interested these publications and uh, keep an eye on, we're still exploring uh, other mechanisms related to uh, yellow fever disease progression based on the samples we collected to our repository. Well, uh, uh, I hope you enjoyed and, and thank you for your attention.